From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Ahead for you today, K-State's Dan Thompson talks with Britton Rucker about the key steps to health management of high-risk beef calves. From disease prevention to low-stress handling of calves and much more, Dan addressed that topic at the recent K-State Beef Stalker Field Day. Following then from Washburn University, Roger McOwen covers two recent decisions by the Kansas Supreme Court with relevance to agriculture, a ruling on a contentious family dispute over whom would inherit a homestead, and a ruling on a case of natural gas migration from one property to the other. And standing by with another stop, look, and listen, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven. All that here on Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. This is Agriculture Today. I'm Britton Rucker. The 2019 Beef Stalker Unit celebrated its 20th anniversary with an array of topics relating to the beef cattle industry, one of those being health management of high-risk calves. With me now is a presenter of that topic from the K-State College of Veterinary Medicine, Dan Thompson. Now, Dan, what classifies as a high-risk calf? The high-risk calf is one that basically we call them mismanaged cattle. And There are low-risk calves and high-risk calves, and I used to think that our cattle procurement agents were were right along alignment with me as a veterinarian saying, oh, these calves are low-risk for morbidity and mortality, and these calves were high-risk for morbidity and mortality. But what I found out was, economically speaking, the ones that are high-risk for health are very unpredictable. And therefore, they're economically a risk when you buy them. You don't know if you're going to get extremely high morbidity. Sometimes we get low morbidity, but it's the variation in that morbidity pattern. But generally speaking, high-risk calves are calves that have not been managed properly prior to being shipped to the feedlot. They haven't been vaccinated. They haven't been weaned. They don't know what a feed bunk is, what a water tank is. They haven't been castrated or dehorned. Uh, They just are very unprepared for the next step. And that adds to the stress, which then decreases the immune response, resulting in higher morbidity, higher mortality than, say, cattle that have been preconditioned on feed for 45 days on the ranch of origin prior to being shipped to the feed yard. Now, what would you recommend to producers to manage these high-risk calves? Well, there's many different things. And the first thing is is that regardless of what we do, many times when we get these cattle in, the horse is out of the barn. And so when we get these calves in, we're going to focus on cattle comfort. We're going to focus on making sure there's good quality long stem hay for them to consume, ample water tank space. I really focus, too, on pin floor management and those receiving pins. I don't want too much mud, and I don't want them, if they're hot, I want to put some bedding down so that these cattle have comfort and they can rest. Then we're going to move to the processing barn, and when we get to the processing barn, the first thing I focus on are our facilities and low-stress cattle handling. As processing incurs, you are the welcome wagon to the feedlot, and so when, when they come into that yard, you're the first people that they see and are you going to be friend or are you going to be foe and can I trust you Mm -hmm. and so that's hugely important to have low stress cattle handling moving those cattle through the chute then work with your veterinarian on a processing protocol vaccinations dewormers castration techniques things to that nature and then we're going to kick them out into the home pen. Now, you mentioned before, but pen space and management of those is an important aspect of managing these high-risk calves. Absolutely. So when they get out to the home pen, the first thing that we're going to kind of look at is, one, you know, I don't want to have a lot of add-ons. So I prefer one-load pens for high-risk calves so that every time I unload a load of calves, I can just put those into a pen and I don't have to worry about commingling other groups on top of them. 
the bunk space question I get is how many inches, and I really don't look at inches. I look at can all the cattle get to the bunk at once. If everything can get to the bunk at one time, I have ample bunk space. Then comes acclimation, okay? Cattle, if you had a secret, you would tell it to someone you trust, not to someone you don't trust. And so cattle, their secret is whether they're sick or not. And until they know that you're a caregiver and not a predator, they won't show you clinical signs. Once we gain their trust, Mm -hmm. then the cattle will say, hey, uh, Bob, you know, I'm sick. Do you mind taking me up there and getting me a shot of miracle myosin? And so they start showing their clinical signs. And we do that a couple of different ways. We do it just by being aware and being in the pen with the cattle extra amount of time during the day for our newly received calves. We might move them corner to corner or something like that. The other one is just open up the gate, move them out of the pen, and bring them back. We're not only getting them used to us, but we're also preparing them for the day of shipment that will be easier to get them out of the pen. When you get newly received calves, how often should a producer monitor those pens? We are riding pens once a day extremely well. A lot of veterinarians recommend that you ride the calves twice a day. If you're going to do that, that's fine. But you need to make sure that if you ride those pins twice a day, start early because you want to be done with that second time before the heat of the day. What is the protocol for shoot examinations on these high-risk calves? Yep. When we get to, to the physical examination of the calves. So the first thing I'm going to look for out in the pen is very similar to what I'm going to see at the shoot. I'm going to look for cattle that are off feed. So gant or something is wrong even if they're not sick, if they're not eating, something's going on with that animal that we need to put it in an environment where it can compete better. Dullness, depression, you know, drooped ears, matted eyes, nasal discharge, cough. Um, a lot of different things that I'm looking for, sunken eyes for dehydration, but animals that are alone, not eating, that are depressed with respiratory distress are animals we're going to bring into the chute. As far as when they get to the chute, the normal rectal temp of a steer is 101.5 to 103.5. And during the summertime when it's hot, it can be up to 104, 104.5 be normal because of the ambient temperature. And that's really key. Absolutely. And so we look to determine abnormal rectal temp. Respiration rate is 10 to 30 breaths per minute. And heart rate is 60 to 80 beats per minute. And then rumen contractions are one to two rumen contractions per minute. But I'm also going to look at the head of that animal. Is it got matted eyes, sunken eyes for dehydration? Is the nose dry? If it is, then that's, you know, it's kind of like when we get sick and you start getting chapped lips, Mm -hmm. (laughs) they get chapped nose. And so understanding that is vitally important in making your diagnosis at the chute to make sure what you pulled out in the pen is, is sick when it gets to the chute. Now, in terms of usage of antibiotics, there are quite a few questions revolving that topic, one of which is single or combinations antimicrobials. You know, in the day of antibiotic stewardship and consumers having a lot of interest in how we use antibiotics, it's vitally important for us to use them correctly. It always has been, but now we're under the magnifying glass. So when we look at proper usage of antibiotics, the first thing is, is none of these products were approved in combination, so only use them singularly. Use one drug followed by another, but don't use them in combination because sometimes the bactericidal and bacteriostatic drugs will actually counteract each other and we get no activity. So working with your veterinarian is vital. There's many things that go into the decision of which antibiotics we use, but combination therapies are not something that we think are, is a good deal. Now, what are some key indicators that you should switch to another drug? Well, you know, we look at our case fatality rate, and if our case fatality rate for groups of cattle starts going above 10%, Mm -hmm. meaning the percentage of cattle that we treated that died divided by the total number of cattle treated, if that's getting above 10%, then we start looking at different antibiotics or different therapies. We expect a 75 to 80% success rate on first treatment response. Mm -hmm. So if we start seeing a first treatment response of 60 or 50, not necessarily going to blame the antibiotic first. I'm going to examine, make sure we're riding our pins properly, identifying the right cattle, and getting them pulled early. But those are some of my key indicators on when to to switch antibiotics. Now, Another thing is really sorting out those sick calves into a hospital pen, as you call it. Our hospital pens are some of the most abused pens 
on the the feedlot and you know we build these beautiful feed alleys and these beautiful feeding mm-hmm. pens and we get done and we say oh wh- what about the hospital and we go oh we haven't you know well let's put it down here by the lagoon and it winds up being some triangle pen that not enough space and a couple things about hospital pens one we need the same amount of space in the hospital pen for cattle that we would give them in a feeding pen that's important two we need good ventilation shade fresh water fresh feed this is our intensive care unit not our oh by the way dump it down there unit and the last one is that the last pin you should fill on your feed yard is the pin next to the hospital and everybody understands that from a biosecurity standpoint you know not putting cattle next to the sick ones but what the reason i really want it is if we have an increase in morbidity i have an overflow pin for more hospital pin space so just some of those things, I think, are critical for managing that hospital. And just making sure your operation overall cleanliness is a key aspect in that, too. It's huge. We have seen, actually, balling guns cause salmonella outbreaks across feed yards. We've seen dirty needles in backpack containers cause joint issues and, and E. coli infections across feed yards. So cleanliness is imperative to a good hospital system. Now, just some overall key takeaways for producers getting these high-risk calves. What would you recommend number one to do on their operation? Number one on their operation is don't overwhelm the system. Know your limits for the number of calves that you can bring in and the amount of help you have. Mm -hmm. Understand that that's probably our number one rate limiting step is just overwhelming everybody. These problems with high-risk calves are not linear. They're exponential and all of a sudden you hit a point where it just goes through the roof and everybody gets exhausted. So I think that's number one. Number two would be make sure you're working with your local veterinarian to have a good treatment and processing protocol in place. The best one is is if you buy them, we know what we're buying. We know we're going to need extra help, twice as much help as we would with low-risk calves, and we should understand what the results are going to be. Well, Dan, thanks for providing much-needed insight and advice on health management of these high-risk calves. You bet. That was Dan Thompson from the K-State College of Veterinary Medicine. I'm Britton Rucker over the K-State Radio Network. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. Coming your way next on this Agriculture Today, it's our regular visit with a professor of agricultural law and taxation out of the Washburn University School of Law, Roger McCohen, and the Kansas Supreme Court has rendered decisions on two distinctly different court cases here in recent weeks, and we want to briefly cover those. And Roger, the first one, well, we've talked many times about the legal intricacies of passing property down to the next generation. And this falls under that heading. It was a a dispute over a homestead, how it was passed down to family members. And uh, this was waged by a divorced couple, of all things. What are the details? Uh, Well, Eric, sometimes property is passed down to the next generation. Sometimes it's attempted to be stolen down to the next generation. (laughs) Uh, That's kind of what was at issue in this case. Uh, You had the decedent in this case who appointed the defendant, which was her ex-daughter-in-law, as her power of attorney under a financial power. And that's that document that we can execute that designates someone to make uh, financial and business decisions on our behalf if we don't want to or we're incapable of doing so. It's a good document that we all should have in place. And many people will name a spouse. If they don't have a spouse, they'll name a child or multiple children. But it's a very common document. And so she's got the daughter-in-law named as the the agent on her power of attorney, but her son had a long history 
of poor financial decisions, and that's why she named the daughter-in-law exclusively and not the son. He had lost 440 acres that she had pledged as security for him, and more than 100000 of her money was lent or just straight up taken out of her accounts by the son. Hmm. So you get an attorney that's hired to keep him from obtaining her home place. She did not want him to have the home place that was to go to either daughter-in-law or grandkids on both sides. Now, she had no animosity with grandkids of either her daughter-in-law or her son. It was just the problem she had with her son. So what she does is execute a transfer on death deed to move that property to the daughter-in-law so that it could be later transferred to her grandsons. So the deed in 2004 was read to her. The legal description was double-checked, and of course this is dealing with her homestead. And one of the grandsons asked if uh, Grandma wanted them to have the property, and she answered yes. And she did this in the presence of five witnesses, and uh, she asked uh, the daughter-in-law to sign her name for her. And sometimes we, we get into those situations as attorneys where we've got clients that can't sign their own name. They'll have someone sign on their behalf. Here, the daughter-in-law was named as her agent and could do so. But a question arose in this case as to whether the daughter-in-law was signing in her authority as the agent or exclusively just and simply at the direction of the mother. Because once the individual passed on, this was challenged by the son, and he was raising that very question as to what capacity the uh, former wife, the uh, ex-daughter-in-law, was operating here, right? Yeah, that's right. And it really strikes me as a case where he's kind of grasping for a very fine legal argument to try to wrestle that homestead away from his sister. Uh, so what you've got here was the, the she signs the transfer on death deed for her mother. The deed is notarized. It's filed. She died five years later in uh, September of 2009. And then in the fall of 2012, the daughter executes a warranty deed that conveys the home place to the grandsons, which is exactly what grandma wanted in this case. In 2014, the son then sues for determination of descent, and he's claiming that the home place should have been in her estate, which means he's going to get an interest in it. The grandsons countered that the property passed to them by the transfer on the death deed, that the signature was effective, and therefore it's not in her estate. The original court ruling on this dispute then actually found for the son, the plaintiff, interestingly enough. Yeah, that's what the trial court said, based on the fact that the daughter could not benefit herself with that right. And so the daughter-in-law then files a motion to reconsider and claim that she did not sign the deed as an agent under the power of attorney. Instead, she signed it in her own right on the direction of her mother-in-law, basically as a scribe. Uh, we refer to that, or the to the legal term for that is amanuensis, but it's basically as, as a scribe. I'm, I'm signing something at the direction of somebody else. The trial court agreed, and the appellate court also agreed with that. And then on, on further review, the Supreme Court agreed with the daughter-in-law's argument. And so now you've got the son coming back in, challenging the validity of that signature, of course, and this, this is what the courts all agreed on, and his argument was he's challenging the validity of the signature, noting that she signed it instead as the agent for the mother. It's a fine legal argument there. He's trying to knock out the validity of the signature, and he's pointing out that uh, she had signed it and then added her name, power of attorney, and whether she had the authority under the power to actually do that or not became the issue, because if she was signing as an agent under power of attorney, there's a, there's a chance here that the signature was not valid. But the Supreme Court did not follow that latter line of thinking there. The ex-daughter-in-law prevailed in the overall ruling, right? Yeah, that's that's exactly what happened, as I indicated earlier. The Supreme Court noted, look, there were six witnesses that testified that the mom here, the decedent, asked the daughter-in-law to sign the deed for her. The son failed to present any evidence to the contrary, and the court also rejected the son's claim that the signature was not properly acknowledged. Instead, that deed was notarized after the daughter-in-law signed it for her mother. The notary attached a notation that indicated that, and the deed was filed three days later and it conformed to state law by being signed. It designated a beneficiary. It was acknowledged by a notary, and it was recorded in the Office of Register of Deeds before mom died. Mm -hmm. And so the court said that the deed signed by the direction of the mom was proper, even though the notary acknowledged that the daughter-in-law 
had a power of attorney that she was uh, serving as agent under. The court also uh, threw out an undue influence claim by saying son failed to rebut the presumption that uh, mom was competent in accordance mm-hmm. with the general competency test for testamentary capacity. Well, this is one of those cases where it's very clear that finer details do matter in this particular arrangement on this case ruled on by the Kansas Supreme Court on September the 6th, and the court ruled on another case out of Kansas on the 6th as well. This regards migrating gas, and that is natural gas, and what the law says about how those who own property where, in this case, the gas migrated, uh, might be able to utilize that particular resource. What are the specifics here? Yeah, it's an interesting common law rule that is in play in Kansas as well as other states where oil and gas industry is big, and it's known as the rule of capture. And What you had here was the plaintiff in this case that operated an underground gas storage facility, and that facility was certified by the proper state and federal commissions. The defendants in this case are producers with wells that are two to six miles from the edge of that certified storage area. So that stored gas migrated to these wells of the defendants, and so they captured and sold the gas as their own. Well, as you can imagine, the plaintiff is irritated by this, and so they sued for lost gas sales, and the defendants moved for summary judgment on the grounds that the Kansas common law rule of capture allowed them to do that, allowed the gas extraction, allowed them to capture it, and then sell it, that migrated gas. And the trial court granted the uh, defendant's motion in this case. Okay, so everything was quiet for a couple of years. But then two years later, the plaintiff received certain to expand their storage area into the areas that contain the defendant's wells. And then now you've got another dispute that came up as to whether the defendants could capture the gas after the storage area was expanded. And again, the trial court held for the defendants upon uh, that situation, that second episode, if you will, under that common law rule of capture. But this was appealed and successfully, you say. Yeah, I, I can imagine what happened when they went back to the trial court. The trial court judge probably uh, had a uh, recollection of, uh, hasn't this case been here before? I, well, it has. I Deja vu. It. It, yeah, said the rule of capture applied. And same thing. Rule of capture applies. Go away. And uh, this time, the plaintiff appealed to the uh, Kansas Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court told the trial court, now, wait a minute, not so fast. We're going to reverse you, and we're going to send this back to you to calculate damages here, because the rule of capture doesn't apply in this situation. The, The Supreme Court said that the rule allows someone that's acting within their legal rights to capture oil and gas. That much is true, that the oil and gas that has migrated from the owner's property to You can use it for your own purpose. And they said that rule is in place because of new technology that's out there, and it is reflective of that, such as injection wells. And it also applies to non-native gas that's injected into common pools for storage. But the court said that's where it ends. The rule does not apply when a party, like the plaintiff in this case, is authorized to store gas and the storage is identifiable. And here the court said that state statutory law does not override the recognized exception to the application of the rule of capture, and this is an exception to that rule of capture. So the court said rule of capture does not apply in this situation where that gas is identifiable uh, from a defined storage area, and uh, so they sent it back to the trial court to compute damages for that lost gas. The full details on that case, the previous case we discussed, and others can be found on the blog that Roger maintains on his website, which is washburnlaw.edu slash W-A-L-T-R. Always something new popping up in this arena, Roger. We appreciate you keeping us abreast of it, and we'll talk again soon. Many thanks. Thank you, Eric. Roger McCohen, Professor of Agricultural Law and Taxation, Washburn University School of Law, right here on Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension.
Agriculture Today continues now here on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson with you. Next up, today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy and part of DTN. Starting with this, the National Pork Producers Council, the National Milk Producers Federation, and the National Corn Growers Association all urged the USDA yesterday to move quickly to implement a bank for vaccines against foot and mouth disease. The group said that an outbreak of foot and mouth disease, which can affect cattle, swine, and sheep, would be disastrous for meat and dairy producers and for the corn growers that sell feed to Livestock producers. There's been no outbreak of foot and mouth since 1929 in the U.S., but it is endemic in large parts of the world, and there is the constant fear that it could spread, according to the groups. Now, the reason for the call is to encourage the USDA to move forward as quickly as possible so that the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service can purchase the volume of vaccines required to effectively contain and eradicate an outbreak. That's according to the chief veterinarian at the National Pork Producers Council, Liz Wagstrom. The groups noted that the 2018 Farm Bill did include $150 million in mandatory funding over five years for APHIS to establish a vaccine bank. Wegstrom noted that APHIS has taken an initial step to determine what vendors might be able to provide the vaccine and that the next step would be to put out a request for proposals to supply that vaccine. According to Iowa State University research, an outbreak would result in $128 billion in losses for the beef and pork sectors, $44 billion and $25 billion respectively, to corn and soybean producers, and job losses of more than $1.5 million across U.S. agriculture over a 10-year time frame. Meantime, yesterday, South Korea confirmed two additional cases of African swine fever near its border with North Korea, despite the heightened efforts to contain the epidemic that has wiped out hog populations across Asia. The Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs said that lab tests confirmed that country's 10th and 11th cases of the disease at two farms in Peju. That's a border town where the first inspection was confirmed back in uh, September. Officials have been scrambling to halt the spread of the disease, disinfecting farms, trucks and roads, banning livestock movement and euthanizing some 93,000 pigs. They plan to euthanize at least 17,000 more. The illness harmless to humans, but highly fatal for pigs. There is no effective vaccine or treatment. Officials have yet to determine where the disease came from, but a likely source is North Korea, which reported an outbreak near its border with China back in May. Well, the 2019 Kansas Junior Livestock Show, the state's largest youth show, awarded auction premiums, showmanship honors, and scholarships this past weekend. Sam Capone reports. The show featured 644 youth from 94 counties, showing 1,396 head of livestock, Baylor Dio of Ulysses led the Grand Champion Market Steer, a 1,374-pound Charlet entry that earned a $4,000 premium. The Reserve Champion Steer, a crossbred weighing 1,335 pounds, was owned by Cooper Henson from Holcomb, who received a $2,000 premium. Grace Ost of Lacine led a Simmental Percentage Female to Supreme Champion Honors in a $1,000 premium in the Heifer Show. Reserve Supreme Champion Female worth a $750 premium went to a commercial heifer led by Abby Wood of Leavenworth. Abby Wood of Leavenworth was the champion senior beef showman with Jody Mead of McPherson winning the intermediate division and Aubrey McCurry from Burton taking the junior title. Landon Roberts of Hillsboro guided his 232-pound dark crossbred to the Grand Champion Market Hog title, earning him $2,000. A 288-pound dark crossbred owned by Chase Lillard from Abilene was selected as a reserve Grand Champion Hog, good for a $1,500 premium. An entry from the commercial division owned by Marley Sutton of Uniontown was named Supreme Champion in the Guilt Show, which was worth a $750 premium. Kinley Morrison from Yates Center exhibited the Reserve Supreme, a commercial gilt worth $600. Brayden Mai from Russell was named Grand Champion Senior in the Swine Showmanship Competition. In the Intermediate Division, Brooklyn Kerr from Dodge City was the champion. The Junior Division champion was Anna Higby from Quinamo. 
Kaylin Dressler of Eudora exhibited the Grand Champion Market Lamb, a 157-pound entry from the Blackface division that earned a $2,000 premium. The Reserve Grand Champion Market Lamb, a 133-pound Blackface, earned Grady Allen of Gardner $1,000. The Supreme Register Breeding U, garnering a $500 premium, was the Champion Hampshire, shown by Clay Brillhart of Fort Scott. The reserve supreme champion out of the All Other Breeds division was led by Rainey Garten of Abilene, who received a $300 premium. An entry led by Clay Brillhart of Fort Scott took supreme champion honors and a $500 premium in the commercial breeding U show. Owning the reserve supreme U worth $400 was Rainey Garten of Abilene. In the senior sheep showmanship, Becca Payne of Hutchinson was named grand champion. Emory Yoho from Yates Center took intermediate sheep showman honors. In the junior division, Brecken Nelson of Tribune was the champion sheep showman. Jack Gillum from Washington received grand champion honors and a $2,000 premium for his 99-pound entry in the Market Goat Show. Kenna Cooley from Lewisburg showed the reserve grand champion Market Goat, which weighed 72 pounds and earned $1,000. Laramie Bruce of Caney showed the supreme champion commercial doe to earn $750. Beckham Payne of Hutchinson exhibited the reserve Supreme Champion Doe worth $500. The champion senior goat showman was Becca Payne from Hutchinson. Kenna Cooley from Lewisburg won intermediate goat showmanship honors. In the junior division, Emery Dieters from St. George was champion. KJLS presented $22,000 in scholarships to 14 exhibitors, earning $2,500 stipends were Gabrielle Hammer of Wallace and Riley Olson from Oldsburg. Those receiving $1,750 scholarships were Wesley Denton, Blue Rapids, Gerilyn Nelson, Soldier, Lucas Sebesta Wilson, and Sarah Sargent, Lebo, Katie Figgy, Onega, Jessica Jensen, Cortland, and Brody Nemechek, Iola, each received $1,500. Scholarships for $1,000 were presented to Rachel Anderson, Jamestown, Lindsay Asher Milford, and Hannah Dutchant Goodland. A team from Kansas State University won the senior college competition at the Mid America Classic Judging Contest held in conjunction with KJLS. Butler Community College won the sophomore division. A team from South Plains College won the freshman division. I'm Sam Capone. Thanks, Sam, for that rundown. Kansas State University, a proud co-sponsor of the Kansas Junior Livestock Show, and our hearty congratulations to all. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Once again, if you haven't checked it out, our podcast service at agtoday.net. This is the K-State Radio Network. Legal and financial concerns surround the day-to-day management of the agricultural industry. Producers, ag creditors, and USDA agencies rely on Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. If you've received an adverse decision from the USDA or have an ag credit concern, call today, 800-321-3276, or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Exploring options. Generating solutions. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. If the fall season is a long, open season, maybe I am successful. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. A few days ago, I bought two large chrysanthemum plants for on the deck to celebrate color, fall, season, and an occasion which happened two years ago. The one plant, yellow, had blooms more open than the other. It's the way I like to buy them. That way, they will last the longest, especially when days are cool and you can place them out of the direct sun. Do not buy mums too early because they won't last that long as the flowers open quickly and hence will quickly fade. That is important if you place them in a pot on the deck or patio. The bigger the pot, the more soil, and of course the bigger the plant, the more color. However, if you want to plant the chrysanthemums in the border as bedding plants to add color, then you should do it early enough so that the plants can get established. 
By the time mine have finished blooming on the patio and giving us pleasure, I will still plant him in the border, but I do not expect great results. If the fall season is a long, open season, maybe I am successful. If not, I'll write it off as a happy expense, like buying a big bouquet of flowers to celebrate. And by the way, do not forget to water the potted mum's daily. To sustain that display of bloom, you need to water. Placing a water-holding saucer under the pot helps. Fall is chrysanthemum time. And when I made my selection, the shipment had just arrived, and I could make my choice carefully. If the weather now stays cool, they will last for several weeks. Of course, I can always go back and make my selection from a later shipment. I expect several fresh shipments to come in yet. The selection of chrysanthemum is very diverse. There are 13 separate flower forms, from very tight pom-pom to irregular open and flower-like. I like the more open blooms and the softer colors. If you live close to a public or botanical garden, you may want to go see if they have a garden display with mums. I know Botanica and Wichita has. Volunteers and master gardeners help plant them. It's a job, starting with soil preparation earlier in the season. They are planted in the ground early September, and with luck and proper care, they should bloom until early frost. In the garden, plant in sunlight six or more hours a day. Plant in a good soil with ample drainage. If the area where you plant is low, raise the bed. Use a mulch to keep soil moisture and temperature even. At the end of the season, after blooming, get your clippers and cut the tops back close to the ground. The new shoots will overwinter and grow into next year's plants. A light mulch will help protect the mums during winter. Do not bury the plants. Evergreen branches placed over the plants can help to control the plants from the extremes of the weather. Of course, next season there is the pinching of the early blooms to get a denser plant. I'm not doing that. I never did. Mine are on the deck, and yes, I water them daily if it doesn't rain, and I try to prolong their blooming by placing them in part shade. However, they do get some sun each day. When I look at our blooming chrysanthemums, it's hard to believe that I'm looking at a plant which had been cultivated in ancient times. They originated as wild daisies in Asia, and the Chinese and Japanese selected bread improved and transformed them over the centuries. Later, the French started to work with the plants. Then the English got hold of the plants. In 1764, a chrysanthemum was shown at the famous Chelsea Gardens. It was the beginning. In America, English and Scottish gardeners brought knowledge and a liking for the plant to North America. In the early 1800s, the breeders slowly introduced the flower to the public. Remember what our country was like in the early 1800s. What is maddening is that there is so much to know. There are books written about chrysanthemums, the history, the culture, and the breeding of new varieties. One can spend his whole life studying one plant, and people have. My simple answer to my frustration is learning what you can and enjoying the plant. And that is what we do with the display on our deck. Remember, it was in honor of a celebration. So, Fall time, autumn, is chrysanthemum time. But when you go into the nurseries and garden centers, you see the big banners proclaiming 
Dutch bulb planting time. And it is. If you have not planted your bulbs yet, get busy. With the rains we've had, it should be easy, especially if you have good garden soil. We always think tulips first, but remember, there are the daffodils, and deer don't like daffodils like they love tulips. But there's the crocus, in all its diversity of color. There are the aliums, the colchigums, the fritillaria, the Sionaroxa, the muscari, the snowdrops, the skillas, and more. I'm not trying to impress you. I'm trying to tease you into enjoying what a garden can give you. Yes, work, but also joy. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. And with that, our time is away once again. As always, thanks for being along with us. Eric Atkinson bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. <music>